Greetings, and welcome to the AMD Third Quarter 2024 Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. And as a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Mitch Hawes, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you, Mitch. You may begin. Thank you and welcome to AMD's third quarter 2024 financial results conference call. By now, you should have had the opportunity to review a copy of our earnings press release and the accompanying slides. If you have not had the chance to review these materials, they can be found on the Investor Relations page of AMD.com. We will refer primarily to non-GAAP financial measures during today's call. The full non-GAAP-to-GAAP reconciliations are available in today's press release and the slides posted on our website. Participants on today's conference call are Dr. Lisa Su, our Chair and Chief Executive Officer, and Jean Hu, our Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Treasurer. This is a live call and will be replayed via webcast on our website. Before we begin, I would like to note that Forrest Norod, Executive Vice President and General Manager, Data Center Business Solutions, will attend the UBS Annual Technology Conference on Tuesday, December 3rd. And Jean Hu will attend the Barclays Global TMT Conference on Thursday, December 12th. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements based on current beliefs, assumptions, and expectations. Speak only as of today, and as such, involve risk and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from our current expectations. Please refer to the cautionary statement on our press release for more information on factors that could cause actual results to differ materially. With that, I'll hand the call over to Lisa. Thank you, Mitch, and good afternoon to all those listening today. We delivered strong top and bottom line growth in the third quarter, with revenue coming in above expectations driven by record instinct and epic product sales and robust demand for our Ryzen PC processors. Third quarter revenue increased 18% year over year to a record $6.8 billion, as significantly higher data center and client processor sales more than offset declines in gaming and embedded product sales. We expanded gross margin by 2.5 percentage points and increased earnings per share by 31% year-over-year as data center segment revenue more than doubled. Turning to the segments, data center segment revenue increased 122% to a record $3.5 billion. We believe we gained server CPU share in the quarter as enterprise wins accelerated, cloud providers expanded their use of Epic CPUs across their infrastructure, and we began the initial ramp of fifth-gen EPIC processors. EPIC has become the CPU of choice for the modern data center, and our multi-generation product portfolio delivers leadership performance and significant TCO advantages across virtually every enterprise and cloud workload. In cloud, EPIC CPUs are deployed at scale to power many of the most important services, including Office 365, Facebook, Teams, Salesforce, SAP, Zoom, Uber, Netflix, and many more. Metal alone has deployed more than 1.5 million Epic CPUs across their global data center fleet to power their social media platforms. Cloudflare selected Genoa X processors with our industry-leading 3D chiplet stacking technology to power their next-generation servers that support twice as many requests per second and deliver 60% higher performance per watt versus their prior generation. Public cloud instances increased 20% year-over-year to more than 950 as Microsoft, AWS, and others launched or expanded their Epic processor-powered offerings in the quarter. Epic instance adoption with enterprise customers also grew in the quarter, highlighted by wins with Adobe, Boeing, Micron, Nestle, Slack, Synopsys, Tata, and others. In the enterprise, sales grew by a strong double-digit percentage year-over-year for the fifth straight quarter as Epic CPU adoption accelerated and sales grew momentum grew. Dell, HPE, Lenovo, and others have expanded the number of fourth-gen Epic platforms they offer by 50% in the last year. There are now more than 200 different Epic solutions available that are optimized for a broad range of enterprise and edge workloads. We are building strong momentum with large enterprise customers, highlighted in the third quarter by wins with large technology, energy, financial services, and automotive companies in the quarter, including Airbus, Daimler Truck, FedEx, HSBC, 
Siemens, Walgreens, and others. We launched our next generation Turin family earlier this month that delivers absolute performance and TCO leadership across both enterprise scale up and cloud native scale out workloads. Turin has already set more than 130 performance records for virtualization, database, AI, business applications, and energy efficiency, with the full EPIC portfolio accounting for more than 500 performance world records. More than 130 fifth-gen EPIC enterprise platforms are in development from all the leading server OEMs and ODMs. These new servers complement existing fourth-gen EPIC platforms, providing a top-to-bottom stack of platforms optimized for a broad range of business applications. In cloud, Google and OCI announced plans to launch fifth-gen EPIC instances early next year, and we expect broad adoption with our largest cloud customers based on the significant performance and efficiency advantages of Turin. As an example, Oracle's Turin instances deliver 35% higher performance per core, 33% faster memory speeds, and double the networking bandwidth, delivering a level of compute performance and capability that is only possible with EPIC CPUs. Looking ahead, we are very well positioned for continued growth and share gains based on the strength of our broad EPIC portfolio and the momentum we have built with cloud and enterprise customers. We also took a major step in the quarter to advance the x86 architecture, forming an ecosystem advisory group with Intel, several industry luminaries, and the largest cloud, PC, and enterprise leaders to accelerate innovation by driving consistency and compatibility across both the x86 instruction set and architectural interfaces, and ensuring we evolve x86 as a compute platform of choice for developers and customers. Turning to our data center AI business, data center GPU revenue ramped as MI300X adoption expanded with cloud, OEM, and AI customers. Microsoft and Meta expanded their use of MI300X accelerators to power their internal workloads in the quarter. Microsoft is now using MI300X broadly for multiple co-pilot services powered by the family of GPT-4 models. Meta announced they have optimized and broadly deployed MI300X to power their inferencing infrastructure at scale, including using MI300X exclusively to serve all live traffic for the most demanding LAMA 405B frontier model. We are also working closely with Meta to expand their instinct deployments to other workloads where MI300X offers TCO advantages, including training. MI300X public cloud instance availability expanded in the quarter with Microsoft, Oracle Cloud, and multiple AI-specialized cloud providers now offering instinct instances with leadership performance and TCO for many of the most widely used models. Instinct cloud instance adoption is strong, with multiple startups and industry leaders adopting MI300 instances to power their models and services, including Essential AI, Fireworks AI, Luma AI, and Databricks. On the AI software front, since launching MI300 10 months ago, we have expanded functionality at every layer of the Rockham stack and increased the number of models that run out of the box on Instinct accelerators to more than 1 million, enabling customers to get up and running as fast as possible with maximum out-of-the-box performance. With the release of Rockham 6.2 last quarter, MI300X inferencing performance has improved 2.4 times since launch, and training performance has increased 80%. We are working closely with a growing number of marquee cloud and enterprise customers to fine-tune their specific inferencing workloads for MI300, with many customers seeing 30% higher performance compared to competitive offerings. And we continue to expand our work with the open source community, broadening support for key frameworks like JAX, libraries like VLLM, and hardware agnostic compilers like Triton. At our Advancing AI event earlier this month, we were excited to be joined by the creators and leaders of some of the most important AI software technologies who have added foundational support for Rockham into Triton, the Llama Stack, SGLang, VLLM, and TensorFlow, and are working to enable broader open source community work with Instinct platforms. With this growing support from the broader AI software ecosystem and the significant advances we have made in our software stack, Rockham now provides AI developers with a truly open software alternative that has been deployed and validated at scale.
To expand our AI systems capabilities, we announced a definitive agreement to acquire ZT Systems, one of the leading providers of AI infrastructure to the world's largest hyperscale computing companies. The ZT team complements our silicon and software capabilities with critical systems expertise needed to deliver rack and cluster level solutions. With ZT, we will be able to design and validate our next-gen AI silicon and systems in parallel, greatly accelerating time to deploy instinct accelerators at data center scale. Customer feedback has been very positive as the ZT acquisition enables hyperscale customers to rapidly deploy AMD AI infrastructure at scale and provides OEMs and ODMs with optimized board and module designs for a wide range of differentiated enterprise solutions. On the regulatory front, we made good progress as we recently passed the HSR waiting period required for U.S. approval. We remain on track to close the acquisition in the first half of 2025. As a reminder, we plan to divest ZT's industry-leading U.S.-based data center infrastructure manufacturing business at the close of the transaction and are pleased that we have received significant interest from a number of parties to date. Looking ahead, we launched our next-gen MI325X GPU earlier this month that extends our memory capacity and bandwidth advantages and delivers up to 20% higher inferencing performance compared to H200 and competitive training performance. Customer and partner interest for MI325X is high. Production shipments are planned to start this quarter with widespread system availability from Dell, HPE, Lenovo, Supermicro, and others starting in the first quarter of 2025. Longer term, we have successfully accelerated our product development pace to deliver an annual cadence of new Instinct products. Our next-gen MI350 series silicon is looking very good and is on track to launch in the second half of 2025 with the largest generational increase in AI performance we have ever delivered. Development on our MI400 series based on the CDNA Next architecture is also progressing very well towards the 2026 launch. We have built significant momentum across our data center AI business with deployments increasing across an expanding set of cloud, enterprise, and AI customers. As a result, we now expect data center GPU revenue to exceed $5 billion in 2024, up from $4.5 billion we guided in July and our expectation of $2 billion when we started the year. Turning to our client segment, revenue was $1.9 billion, an increase of 29% year-over-year, driven by strong demand for our latest generation Zen 5 notebook and desktop processors. Desktop channel sales grew by a significant double-digit percentage led by the launch of our Ryzen 9000 series processors that deliver leadership productivity, gaming, and content creation performance. We are seeing strength across our Ryzen desktop portfolio and are on track to launch our next-gen Ryzen 9000 X3D processors in November with leadership gaming performance. In mobile, Ryzen AI 300 series sales ramped significantly from the prior quarter as Acer, HP, Lenovo, Asus, and others announced new consumer and commercial notebooks with leadership compute and AI performance. We made good progress expanding our presence in the commercial PC market in the quarter, closing multiple large deals with AstraZeneca, Bayer, Mazda, Shell, Volkswagen, and other enterprise customers. We also launched our Ryzen AI Pro 300 series family, the first CPUs with enterprise class security, manageability, and AI capabilities for Copilot Plus PCs. HP and Lenovo are on track to more than triple the number of Ryzen AI Pro platforms they offer in 2024, and we expect to have more than 100 Ryzen AI Pro commercial platforms in market next year, positioning us well for share gains as businesses refresh the hundreds of millions of Windows 10 PCs that will no longer receive Microsoft technical support starting in 2025. Now turning to our gaming segment, revenue declined 69% year-over-year to $462 million. Semi-custom sales declined as Microsoft and Sony reduced channel inventory. Sony announced the PS5 Pro with significant increases in graphics and ray tracing performance and AI-driven upscaling, featuring a new AMD semi-custom SoC that extends our multi-generational partnership. 
In gaming graphics, revenue declined year over year as we prepare for a transition to our next-gen Radeon GPUs based on our RDNA 4 architecture. In addition to a strong increase in gaming performance, RDNA 4 delivers significantly higher ray tracing performance and adds new AI capabilities. We are on track to launch the first RDNA 4 GPUs in early 2025. Turning to our embedded segment, third quarter revenue decreased 25% year over year to 927 million. Embedded demand continues recovering gradually, led by strength in test and emulation, offset by ongoing softness in the industrial market. Momentum continues building for our differentiated versatile family of adaptive SOCs, led by strong demand for our Versal Premium VP1902, which is the world's largest adaptive SOC in FPGA that is powering multiple platforms for all three of the largest EDA vendors. Our Versal portfolio is also being adopted broadly across multiple aerospace customers. As one example, SpaceX recently launched their latest generation broadband satellites powered by Versal AI Core adaptive SOCs. To build on this momentum, we taped out Telluride last quarter, the first product in our second-gen Versal family that delivers up to 10x more compute and enables AI application acceleration on a single chip. Design wind momentum is very strong across our portfolio, tracking to grow more than 20% year-over-year in 2024, and positioning us well to grow our embedded business faster than the overall market in the coming years. In summary, the business accelerated in the third quarter, and we expect strong demand for our Instinct, Epic, and Ryzen processors to result in another quarter of significant year-over-year growth. Taking a step back, this month marks my 10th anniversary as AMD CEO. In the last 10 years, we have successfully completed multiple arcs, first by turning the company around and setting the solid financial and operational foundation required for sustained growth and then by transforming AMD into the high-performance and adaptive computing leader. While I'm incredibly proud of what we've accomplished, I'm even more excited about the unprecedented growth opportunities in front of us. Looking out over the next several years, we see significant growth opportunities across our data center, client, and embedded businesses, driven by the nearly insatiable demand for more compute. Each of these opportunities is amplified exponentially by the rapid adoption of AI, which is enabling new experiences that will make high-performance computing an even more essential part of our daily lives. In the data center alone, we expect the AI Accelerator TAM will grow at more than 60% annually to $500 billion in 2028. To put that in context, this is roughly equivalent to annual sales for the entire semiconductor industry in 2023. Beyond the data center, we are adding leadership AI capabilities across our product portfolio and partnering deeply with a broad ecosystem of partners to deliver differentiated AI solutions at scale. This is an incredibly exciting time for AMD as the breadth of our technology and product portfolios, combined with our deep customer relationships and diversity of markets we address, provide us with a unique opportunity as we execute our next arc and make AMD the end-to-end -end AI leader. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Jean to provide some additional color on our third quarter results. Jean? Thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll start with a review of our financial results and then provide our current outlook for the fourth quarter of fiscal 2024. We're very pleased with our strong third quarter financial results. On a year-over-year -year basis, Data center segment revenue more than doubled, and client segment revenue grew 29%. We expanded gross margin by 250 basis points, and drew earnings per share growth of 31%. For the third quarter of 2024, revenue was 6.8 billion, up 18% year over year, and the revenue as revenue growth in our data center and client segment was partially offset by lower revenue in our gaming and embedded segment. Revenue increased 17% sequentially, primarily driven by growth in our data center and client segment. Gross margin was 54%, up 250 basis point year over year, primarily driven by higher data center segment revenue. 
Operating expenses were 1.96 billion, an increase of 15 percent year over year as we continue to invest in R&D and go-to-market activities. Operating income was 1.7 billion, representing a 25 percent operating margin. Taxes, interest expense, and other was 211 million. Diluted earning per share was 92 cents, an increase of 31 percent year over year and 33 percent sequentially. Now turning to our reportable segment. Starting with the data center. Data center delivered record quarterly segment revenue of 3.5 billion, up 122 percent, nearly a 2 billion increase year over year and increase of 25 percent sequentially. Growth in revenue was led primarily by the strong ramp of AMD instant GPU shipment and growth in AMD Epic CPU sales. The data center segment accounted for 52% of total revenue in the third quarter. Data center segment operating income was 1 billion or 29% of revenue compared to 306 million or 19% a year ago. Data center segment operating income more than tripled compared to the prior year, driven by higher revenue and operating leverage. Client segment revenue was 1.9 billion, up 29% year over year and 26% sequentially, driven primarily by strong demand for our Zen 5 AMD Ryzen processors. Client segment operating income was 276 million, or 15% of revenue, compared to an operating income of 140 million a year ago, or 10% of revenue, primarily driven by higher revenue, partially offset by higher operating expenses. Gaming segment revenue was 462 million, down 69% year over year, and 29% sequentially primarily due to a decrease in semi-customer revenue. Gaming segment operating income was 12 million, or 2% of revenue, compared to 208 million, or 14% a year ago. Embedded segment revenue was 927 million, down 25% year over year as customers continue to normalize their inventory levels. Revenue increased 8% sequentially as demand improved in several end markets. Embedded segment operating income was 372 million or 40% of revenue compared to 612 million or 49% a year ago. Turning to the balance sheet and the cash flow, during the quarter we generated 628 million in cash from operations and the free cash flow was 496 million. Excluding certain non-recurring payments related to acquisitions from operating cash flows, our free cash flow was 619 million. Inventory increased sequentially by 383 million to 5.4 billion, primarily to support the continued ramp of data center segment products. At the end of the quarter, cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investment was $4.5 billion. In the third quarter, we returned $250 million of cash to shareholders, repurchasing 1.8 million shares, and we have $4.9 billion of authorization remaining. Now turning to our fourth quarter of 2024 outlook, we expect revenue to be approximately $7.5 billion plus or minus 300 million, up 22% year over year, driven by strong growth in our data center and the client segments, more than offsets decline in the gaming and the embedded segments. We expect revenue to be up approximately 10% sequentially, driven primarily by growth across data center, client, and the gaming segments. In addition, we expect the fourth quarter non-GAAP growth margin to be approximately 54%. Non-GAAP operating expenses to be approximately 2.05 billion. Non-GAAP other net income to be 17 million. Non-GAAP effective tax rate to be 13%. And the diluted share count is expected to be approximately 1.64 billion shares. 
In closing, we are pleased with our strong execution in the third quarter. We delivered record revenue along with the strong year-over-year -year expansion in gross margin and earnings per share growth. Looking ahead, we are very well positioned to deliver another record quarter of revenue in the fourth quarter, driven by continued momentum in our data center and the client segment. Importantly, we are making a strategic investment at the position AMD as the end-to-end -end AI infrastructure leader and drive long-term profitable growth. With that, I'll turn it back to Mitch for the Q&A session. Thank you, Jean. John, let's pull the audience for questions. Thank you, Mitch. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the question queue. You may press star two to remove yourself from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. And the first question comes from the line of Toshia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking the question. Um, my first one is on the data center GPU uh, business. Uh, Lisa, you took up your 24 outlook by 500 million. Curious um, what, what drove the change there. Uh, and more importantly, as you look forward into calendar 25, um, I, I doubt you're going to give us quantitative guidance on, on this call, but you know, conceptually, how are you thinking about growth in your instinct business um, between your, your large cloud customers and your enterprise customers? And if you can speak to the possibility of adding new customers within cloud, again, specific to instinct, that would be really helpful. Sure, Toshia, thank you for the question. So first of all, uh, we had a, a very strong quarter for the data center overall in Q3, and especially for the instinct product portfolio. We actually uh, completed um, some important customer milestones, and we were able to ramp um, a bit above our initial uh, expectations. So data center GPU was very strong in the third quarter, and we raised overall uh, guidance for the year um, from – exceeding 4.5 billion to exceeding 5 billion uh, based on the completion of some of those customer milestones. So we feel good about the trajectory as we go through the end of this year. And then to your um, overall question about 2025, at a high level, uh, look, we feel very good about the market. Um, you know, from everything that we see, talking to customers, uh, there's still sig uh, significant investment in trying to build out the infrastructure required um, across, um, you know, all of the AI workloads. And then within that, our product portfolio is, um, is getting stronger with the um, annual cadence launching 325 um, later uh, later this uh, quarter and uh, 355 in the second half of next year. And then in terms of customers, our customer engagements are actually uh, broadening quite well. So uh, and it's, it's broadening in two ways. So certainly cloud, um, you know, our largest cloud customers are broadening the set of workloads uh, that they're running. Um, on, uh, on AMD Instinct, and uh, we're also very engaged with a number of large cloud and enterprise customers uh, that are um, actively uh, working with us on optimizing their workloads, and you know, we would expect uh, you know, those would be good opportunities uh, for us over the next couple of quarters as well. Great. And then a quick follow-up, uh, maybe one for Gene on, on gross margin. Um, you're, you're guiding Q4 gross margin essentially flat uh, sequentially. If you can walk through the puts and takes there, that would be really helpful. And then, again, as you look forward into 25, um, you know, you're, you're kind of speaking to continued data center growth. Um, one would think the embedded business uh, hopefully begins to – to recover, and then you know, within some of your businesses like server CPU, I would expect uh, enterprise to 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 grow perhaps faster off a low base. So I, I do think you have a lot going for you for, from a gross margin standpoint. But um, you know, are, are those points valid? And and what should we be what should we be thinking about in terms of potential headwinds as well? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, first, uh, we are very pleased with our Q3 gross margin performance. We delivered a 53.6% and that we are guiding approximately 54% uh, in Q4. Uh, in general, when you look at the 2024, our gross margin improvement has been primarily driven by the mix, especially data center business continue to be the strong growth driver of our business 
it's accounting for more than 50% of our revenue mix. That helps us to improve gross margin. Uh, going to 2025, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to to guide specifically, but uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are puts and the takes that will help us going forward. Uh, I would say first is uh, going forward, the largest growth driver is our data center business, both the CPU side, the GPU side, and you are absolutely right. Uh, we see our enterprise server business continue to expand. That will be a tailwind on gross margin side. And secondly, embedded business is recovering and gradually, but uh, that will also help us with our gross margin. Uh, at the same time, we're also seeing our client business expansion nicely. Uh, client business today is more focused on consumer side, which tend to be below corporate average. That's some, something headwind we'll deal with. And lastly, I would say our team has done a great job to continue to improve operational efficiency. Uh, when we scale the company next year, you can see we're going to benefit from econ economics of scale to continue to drive operational efficiency to improve gross margin. And the next question comes from the line of Aaron Rakers with Wells Fargo. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. I, I'll do two as well. Um, I guess maybe building on the latter point that you just made, I'm, I'm curious of how you would characterize your, your supply chain having evolved, uh, now talking about five plus billion. How, how do we think about what you've been doing on the supply side, given the lead times, the production cycles of these MI? Uh, 300 and 325 GPUs as we look out into 2025. And I have another quick yeah, one. Sure, Aaron. So, uh, look, I've, I've been uh, very happy with how our supply chain has ramped um, over the last number of quarters. Uh, you know, it's clearly it's a tight supply environment, but we've done um, a great job getting, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, we, we have capacity across the entire supply chain. You know, again, that was part of the reason for the um, the higher revenue in the third quarter um, around our instinct business, just, you know, both customer uh, demand as well as uh, supply chain improvement. And going um, into the next, uh, you know, a few quarters, going into 2025, I think we uh, expect that the environment will continue to be tight, but we've also uh, planned uh, for significant growth going into 2025. And so we feel good about our uh, overall supply chain capability. Yeah. And then as a quick follow-up, when, when I look at the, the sequential guidance and revenue at the midpoint, let's call it about $680 million up uh, sequentially, could you help us frame of how much of that is driven by client versus the, the data center piece of the business? Thank you. Sure, Aaron. Uh, so uh, certainly if you look at the sequential uh, guide, um, the, the largest contributor um, is the data center business. And, uh, you know, that that is now – uh, such a large piece of our business. It's over 50% of our business in um, in Q3, and it will uh, continue to grow um, in Q4. Uh, client segment, uh, we also expect to perform well. Uh, I think we've done, uh, you know, very well with our launches this year, both on the, the desktop, you know, Zen 5 launches, as well as uh, the notebook um, AIPC launches. So we expect, um, you know, growth there. And then, you know, the other segments on a sequential basis, you know, gaming embedded would be more modest. And the next question comes from the line of Ross Seymour with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Hi, guys. Thanks for letting me ask a question. And, Lisa, congrats on the 10-year anniversary. The, uh, Gene, when you gave the segment guidance, kind of playing off the last question, uh, you didn't mention embedded as, as being up. Uh, and, and then, Lisa, you just talked about it being up less. i just curious. I know it's a, a kind of a muted recovery, but what's happening in the embedded business implied in your fourth quarter guidance, and how are you thinking about 2025 just directionally? Sure, Ross. Um, let me start, and then maybe Gene can add. Uh, look, we've seen um, some improvement in the embedded business. You saw some improvement um, in uh, the sequential in, in Q3. Uh, we expect some you know, modest improvement um, in Q4. What we're seeing is really a mix across the different subsegments uh, in, in embedded. There are some segments that are stronger. Uh, so our uh, test and emulation business um, actually did very well. Uh, we're ramping our new uh, you know, versatile um, uh, platform there. Um, uh, aerospace and defense, uh, you know, did well. Also continues to, uh, you know, be uh, relatively strong. Um, you know, communications has not seen much recovery, so I would say that that's still, 
um, you know, fairly muted, and um, industrial is also a little bit on the softer side. So, you know, between all of those, uh, we expect um, a little bit of growth um, into, you know, Q4, and let's call it uh, a modest uh, growth in uh, 2025, but we're, you know, planning for it to be a little bit mixed amongst the segments. You know, maybe, Jean, if you want to add. Well, I think you covered. Okay. Great, and I guess for my follow-up, just on the, the Epic business, uh, you've done incredibly well there, Lisa. Have you seen any kind of loosening up of the crowding out effect with the, the well, in your case, the instinct side taking demand away from the Epic side? It doesn't seem to have slowed you down much this year. You're still up by, my math, maybe 33% or so. And, and how are you thinking about that kind of CPU versus GPU dynamic from a customer spend perspective as we look into 25? Yeah, uh, sure. Let me talk a little bit about the uh, the data center CPU business. Uh, look, we've been um, extremely pleased uh, with um, the progress there. I think the market environment has uh, certainly gotten better over the last couple of quarters. Uh, we've seen um, some of the large cloud customers uh, now, uh, you know, sort of adding to their uh, data center capacity and refreshes. Uh, we've seen enterprises also. Uh, start with some of their modernization um, activities. Uh, within that, you know, sort of market environment, um, our product portfolio has done extremely well. So here in the third quarter, um, the Zen 4 portfolio between Genoa and Bergamo uh, was uh, very strong. Uh, we saw the beginning ramp of our uh, Zen 5 Turin uh, capabilities, and then uh, we also actually saw pretty good uh, demand even on Zen 3 or our Milan family, just given the, the performance of, you know, price uh, uh, ratios there. So overall, we have a very strong top-to-bottom stack, and we do see some uh, strength in uh, the overall, you know, server market, which adds to some of the, you know, AI opportunity that we have. And the next question comes from the line of Ben Reitzis with Melius Research. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, um, if I could stick to the pattern of two, I want to follow up a little bit on servers, and, and thanks for the question. Um, going into next year, uh, it, it seems like you're poised for, for more share gains, and I was just wondering, um, there, there is a perception, you know, that um, GPUs are cannibalizing, you know, the servers, but what are you seeing specifically in Turin? Um, is it with this momentum that you're talking about, is it – the right CPU for a GPU, um, are hyperscalers in particular liking the fact you can consolidate and create more room for AI gear? What, what is the particular catalyst and, and what, what that you're seeing out there with this uh, upgrade? Thanks. Sure, Ben. So I think when I look at, you know, Turin and the, the environment going into uh, 2025, uh, you know, Turin is actually very well optimized for you know, sort of the broad set of uh, server workloads or traditional, you know, CPU workloads, including uh, both scale-up and scale-out workloads. So I think that is, um, is very positive. Uh, we believe that there will be strong AI uh, content uh, on CPUs, and that helps Turin as well. Um, you know, it's also an important piece of the head node of any you know GPU configuration. So overall, I think those are all um, you know good catalysts for us. And uh, primarily, we're at this point where we're expanding the workloads in general as we are uh, working with our largest cloud customers, and uh, we're making strong progress in enterprise, which has been you know very important for us. You know, the enterprise sale takes longer. Um, there's um, you know a significant amount of you know, POC work and, and just, uh, you know, just making sure that CIOs are familiar with our offerings. Uh, but I think between our, um, our Zen 4, Zen 5 um, offerings now, we, we really have a very broad portfolio that satisfies, um, you know, the vast majority of the, uh, the you know, traditional CPU workloads. Okay, thanks. And then I just want to follow up on the PC market. There's just, you guys keep outperforming, but there's just general concerns that, uh, of consumer weakness, and I was just wondering, you know, what you're seeing in the 4Q, and, you know, is there a risk of uh, more than seasonal decline in the 1Q, or, um, you know, do you feel like things will, will keep going unabated uh, in the PC market for you guys particularly? Well, we see a few things um, in the PC market. So our, our business tends to be uh, more consumer-weighted, so the second half of the year is usually stronger than the first half of the year. And um, this year, that's added to the fact that we have um, a couple of product launches. So we launched our desktop products 
uh, for uh, with Zen 5 and our Ryzen 9000 series. And we also launched our AIPC uh, next generation Ryzen AI 300 products. So I think the, the combination of those two have given us, let's call it a, a stronger than uh, the normal uh, second half of the year. You know, I would expect uh, there will be seasonality going into the first half. Of, you know, that's that's typical in our business. I think the main point is, I mean, w w this is the strongest uh, you know PC portfolio we've had, um, you know, sort of in uh, in our in our history. I think across desktop and and notebook. And as we go into 2025, I think there's generally some optimism about uh, the. The PC market, let's call it maybe growing mid single digits, and within that, uh, you know, we have the AI PC, um, you know, catalyst as well as uh, you know some of the the Windows 10 um, sort of end of support, um, you know, coming in 2025 as as catalyst. So uh, I think we feel good about you know the PC market in 2025, but we would expect some level of seasonality uh, going into the first half of the year. And the next question comes from the line of Joshua Bucalter with TD Cowan and Company. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'll keep it to one since I'm new here. Um, on the data center GPU side, I realize everyone wants new customer announcements and 2025 guidance, but, we're, you know, we're not going to get that, certainly not today. Um, that said, maybe you could speak to how much of a runway you think exists at existing customers and how much of a catalyst MI325X on CDNA3 and then MI355 on the new architecture can be to growing revenue and workload breadth internally and externally at these existing customers as we think about growth into next year at the data center GPU side. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Joshua. Thanks for the question. So, uh, look, maybe um, let, let me start again with this uh, this notion of uh, we're very pleased with the progress that we've made in the data center GPU business. I mean, if you think about when we started the year, uh, we were, you know, just launching MI300. Uh, you know, we had talked about, you know, perhaps, you know, $2 billion of revenue in 2024. And as we've gone through the last few quarters, what we've done is we've uh, successfully completed a number of customer milestones. And those customer milestones include things like, uh, you know, ensuring that we are, um, you know, at scale in data centers, meeting all of the, uh, the the reliability requirements and so on and so forth, as well as optimizing on specific workloads and ensuring that we have very, very performant, um, out-of-the-box performance. So I think we have, um, you know, gained a lot of confidence um, over uh, the last couple of quarters, just seeing how the customers have ramped. Um, I know everyone would like it to go faster. We think it's actually going really well. Uh, and um, being able to you know, talk about exceeding $5 billion of revenue in 2024, I think we feel really good about that. You know, going into 2025, um, I, we feel great about the market. The market continues to be um, the place where uh, there's a significant uh, CapEx investments. We feel great about our product portfolio. It is getting stronger. Uh, with everything that we've learned off of the MI300 ramp. And then in particular on the software side, uh, you know, we have uh, greatly increased our, our customer support, customer engagement, out-of-box performance, you know, open source ecosystem, all of those components uh, that are necessary to ensure that customers can run, um, you know, at scale, at performance, at a great, um, you know, TCO. So all those, um, you know, together, I think we have a good opportunity to grow at our current customers with the um, number of workloads. You heard uh, Meta talking at our event about um, expanding from, you know, inference on their, you know, large language um, models with uh, with Llama 3.1 to some training workloads. Uh, Microsoft has also been a, a very, very great um, a great partner with that. And then you should assume that we're working with all of the large customers out there, and, you know, many of them are, uh, you know, very uh, deep engagements with us to, you know, continue to uh, optimize, uh, you know, their software to our uh, to our hardware. So, th you know, those are the opportunities in front of us. Thank you, and congrats on an amazing decade at AMD. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Timothy Arcuri with UBS. Please proceed with your question. Hi, thanks. Uh, I had a quick one and then a more, uh, a, you know, more extensive question. So the you know, first one is uh, I wanted to ask about the September actuals for data center GPU. It seems like it was in the billion five range, and that would put December in kind of the two billion range. Is that about right? So that's a pretty granular question, uh, Timothy, but um, maybe let me help you with this. Uh, we, we actually 
uh, did better in the data center GPU uh, business relative to um, our initial expectations. So you would imagine that, uh, you know, the business was actually greater than $1.5 billion. I mean, we're actually seeing now our uh, GPU business really approaching the scale of our CPU business. Great. And then just kind of more broadly on the shape of next year, I mean, you see that the market with these big customers, how do you see the shape of uh, revenue off of that CQ4, uh, um, you know, number? Can you continue to grow off that level? Or do you see some risk maybe of a pause next year? And I and I ask because MI355 is dropping into the existing infrastructure, and I think you did say you'll have a liquid-cooled option, but, you know, you do hear about some customers wanting rack scale. So I wonder if you worry, a, you know, a bit about there could be a pause before you get to rack scale in 2026. Thanks. Yeah, I, I guess I would put it like this. I mean, look, this business um, is, uh, you know, th there's there's a lot of activity going on, and we're spending time with customers as they're building out their data centers, um, some preferred you know, air-cooled environments, liquid-cooled environments, you know, some want rack scale, you know, some are perfectly happy to go into their existing data center uh, infrastructure. So there are lots of different variants. Um, what I would say about uh, 2025 is we feel, um, you know, very good about the growth opportunities. Um, I would say that, you know, it might be lumpy. Uh, in general, these are, you know, large customer acquisitions and, uh, you know, there, it's not always predictable exactly uh, which quarters you would expect the uh, significant build out, but I think overall we feel good about the uh, trajectory into 2025. Um, if that's helpful. And the next question comes from the line of Joe Moore with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the the five billion of AI revenue, how that breaks down between training and inference, if you're able to assess that, and just, you know, I know you sort of started off with most of the traction in inference, but you've seen some traction on the training side. Can you just talk about what that split looks like going forward as well? Sure, Joe. So uh, uh, certainly from the uh, the five billion that we're talking about, um, the, the early traction has been uh, primarily with inference, just given the strength of the product portfolio. Uh, you know, MI300 is like very, very well optimized for inference uh, given uh, the memory uh, capacity and memory bandwidth uh, capabilities, but we have had um, some uh, you know, training adoption, and we expect that that will continue to grow as uh, we go through the next uh, few quarters. And so, you know, as we you know, let's call it fast forward a year, I would say we would have a, um, a fairly balanced you know, portfolio between training and inference. Great, thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. I had uh, two. Uh, so, Lisa, for the first one, how do you address this uh, uh, investor argument that MI is off to a great start, but uh, spec-wise um, remains kind of uh, one year behind the industry leader, right? You are shipping something comparable to Hopper while they're starting to ship uh, Blackwell next year, when you're at MI350, they will be on Blackwell Ultra or Rubin. So how do you see AMD closing uh, that gap, and can you really gain share until that gap is uh, closed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, I actually don't see that. So, um, you know, maybe let me state it in, um, in, in another way. I, I think MI300, when we launched it, was um, uh, behind, you know, H100. H100 was in the market uh, for a much longer uh, longer time, you know, when, and we have, uh, with our accelerated roadmap, actually, uh, you know, closed um, a good part of that gap. Uh, I think MI325 is a great product. It's going to compete very well with H200, and the MI350 series will compete uh, very well with Blackwell. In the overarching view of the world, um, you know, frankly, the, uh, the, mar the market continues to be constrained, um, particularly in the newer, uh, you know, product, um, you know, generations, it takes a long time to go from, let's call it shipping your first samples, uh, to actually ramping in, you know, volume, uh, you know, production workloads. And I think one of the advantages that we have with the, um, with our uh, portfolio is that from a, a data center, you know, retrofit standpoint, it's actually a much easier, um, uh, you know, ramp, just the, the infrastructure is the same. So, look, there, there are lots of opportunities, you know, across the, um, the, the set of AI workloads. Uh, we, we think this roadmap is actually strengthening um, over time, and, and that's the feedback that we're getting from our customers. 
And for my uh, follow-up, Lisa, uh, back to the question on the PC uh, market. So it was up, uh, or the client uh, was up 26% um, sequentially. I think you are guiding to some growth in, in Q4 um, as well. How do you see the state of the channel? And I ask that uh, just because, uh, you know, sell-through in Q3 was not that great, and I think Intel had carried down their uh, Q3 to be flat or down. So just how much of the growth that you are seeing is uh, because of ASPs, uh, how much of uh, this is units? And as you look out to 2025, uh, do you think um, the ASP uh, strength that we have seen this year, can, can that mix uh, benefit continue for you in 25 also? Yeah, uh, in fact, the way I would say it is um, our client business has um, a few factors that may be slightly different from the overall market. So, you know, let me start with our desktop channel. I think our share is very high in the desktop channel, and, uh, you know, we've done, uh, you know, very well there. So we saw strength across that portfolio in Q3. We actually saw, you know, some of our highest sell-through, so it was a strong sell-through quarter, and, and obviously um, it shows in the revenue results. Um, I think on the on the notebook uh, standpoint, um, you know, our business tends to be more heavily consumer-weighted, and so that is more of a second-half uh, story. Um, there is good momentum around AI PCs. I mean, we've looked at some of the activation rates of our newest Ryzen AI 300 uh, you know, processors, and the activation rates are good. It's still very early in the AI PC cycle, uh, but we are seeing, um, you know, some good uh, momentum there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we'll see, you know, both units up, and, uh, you know, the ASPs will depend a little bit on the mix between consumer and enterprise and desktop and notebooks. Um, but, you know, my earlier comments about, you know, the client segment, I think it is an opportunity for us. We are underrepresented in the client segment, uh, and, um, you know, we see an opportunity to grow both in uh, consumer as well as enterprise. And the next question comes from the line of Harlan, sir, with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, Lisa, on your core Epic business, you know, you did start to see recovery in enterprise last quarter. It was broad-based across many verticals. You've got a, you've also got a growing share dynamic as well, right? And it sounds like that trend continued in the September quarter. Do you anticipate continued follow-through in terms of quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth this quarter for enterprise? And then maybe what sort of enterprise and general cloud demand trends are you seeing out of China? Sure. Uh, so, Harlan, thanks for the question. Uh, we did see, uh, you know, positive growth momentum uh, here in the third quarter in enterprise. Uh, we are getting broader adoption. Uh, and we're seeing that growth both in on-prem deployments as well as cloud third-party deployments. And so we're very happy with sort of the adoption of our cloud instances uh, when people are doing, you know, migrations. They're migrating from on-prem to cloud they're migrating to AMD or they're migrating from older cloud instances to newer cloud instances. Uh, we're seeing uh, migrations to AMD. So I think that that helps us in both the uh, enterprise segment as well as the cloud segment. Um, as we go forward into uh, the fourth quarter, I think we are expecting um, another quarter of, of growth um, on a sequential basis uh, for our, our server business and, uh, you know, strength in both enterprise and cloud. Uh, and I think, um, you know, as we think about our opportunities going forward, uh, you know, the enterprise business is a place where we have been underrepresented. I think our portfolio has strengthened, so the platforms that are being offered by the OEMs have broadened uh, with, mm -hmm. um, you know, not just, uh, you know, Zen 4, but also with the Zen 5 uh, capability, uh, you know, Zen 5 uh, portfolio launch. And so I think those are opportunities for us in 2025. Yeah, on your China question, uh, we are – you know, underrepresented in China market in the service CPU side. So, as Lisa said, that's another opportunity for us to continue to gain share. Perfect. Thank you. And the next question comes to the line of Stacy Razgan with Bernstein Research. Please proceed with your question. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question. For the first one, um, I wanted to go back to what you said about the size of the data center GPUs in the quarter. You said it was approaching the size of your of your compute business, which was, was put it around what, under 1.7 billion, maybe a little more. And number one, is that right? And like, if that is right, it implies that at five billion for the year, you'd actually be down in Q4. So I'd probably got to be 5.2 or 5.3 billion for the full year just to be flat sequentially, and more than that to get growth. So 
I guess the question number one, is that the size of the business that you're talking about in Q3? And is that the kind of level of growth you're thinking into Q4? Like, how should I be yeah. thinking about that? Right, Stacey. So first, a couple of things. Um, you, know, you have to remember that in our data set, our segment, we have some other revenue that is not CPUs and GPUs, right? We have some FPGAs uh, and other things. But, uh, you know, the, the question earlier was, you know, was the revenue 1.5? And I said I, I that it was greater than 1.5. So, you know, take that as a, as a fundamental. And then as uh, we talked about, we didn't guide an exact number for the data center GPU. We said exceed 5 billion. And so you should assume that it exceeds 5 billion. Okay, thanks. Um, for my follow-up, you talked a little bit about lumpiness next year. Is there any kind of seasonality or something that I ought to be thinking about specifically in the Q1 for data center GPU? I, I know you have like the MI300, I guess, ramping into production at that point, but should I be thinking about a seasonal, like seasonality in the Q1 given the, the general statement on lumpiness? I, I wasn't implying something about seasonality of the data center GPU business. I was implying more that, you know, if you think about – uh, the evolution of the business, it depends quite a bit on, you know, you know, a specific number of customers. So these are large customers that drive uh, deployments. Like, for example, the third quarter was a bit higher than we expected. That was driven by, by uh, some additional customer, de customer demand, and we may see that type of lumpiness. So that, that was what I was implying. Um, and, you know, we'll have to see how things evolve as we get into uh, 2025. We have time for two more questions. The next question comes from the line of Harsh Kumar with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, hey Lisa. First of all, congratulations on your 10-year anniversary. I just looked at the 10-year chart. The stock is around $3, so heck of a job here. And also, congratulations on $5 billion in uh, instant revenues. So I wanted to ask the first question. This is one we get from investors all the time. Um, in the coming year, let's say 2025, your key competitor will take most of the TAM of the AI market, the GPU market, rough count. They'll take in something like 50, 60 billion. You'll get another 5 to 10 billion, call it. So the question is, what do you think is the major hindrance? You've got chip level compatibility. So does it boil down to the fact that you're just earlier in the game? You've been doing this just 12 months in a serious manner, or is there still a rack level disparity? If you could just help us think about what the hindrances are to you becoming a major player here. Yeah, sure, Harsh. Thanks for the question and uh, for the comments. Um, maybe let me say, uh, I, I view them as opportunities. You know, if you remember, Harsh, and I, I think you do, uh, our epic ramp, you know, from you know, Zen 1, Zen 2, Zen 3, Zen 4, uh, you know, we had uh, extremely good product even, you know, back in the Rome days, but uh, it does take time. Uh, to, you know, ensure that there is, you know, trust built, there is familiarity with um, uh, the product set. Um, there are some differences, although, you know, there, you know we're, we're both GPUs, there are some differences, obviously, in the software environment. And people want to get comfortable with the, uh, the workload ramp. So from a ramp standpoint, um, I'm actually very positive on the, uh, the ramp rate. It's the fastest product ramp that I've seen, um, you know, overall. And, um, you know, my view is, you know, this is a multi-generational journey. We've always said that. Um, we feel uh, very good about the progress. Um, I think, you know, next year is going to be um, about, you know, expanding both customer set as well as workload. And um, as we get into the MI400 series, uh, you know, we think it's an exceptional product. So um, all in all, uh, the, the ramp is going uh, well, and, you know, we will continue to you know, earn and, um, you know, earn the trust and the, the partnership of um, these large customers. What I will say is um, customers are very, very open to AMD. And um, we see that everywhere we go, uh, you know, everyone is giving us a, a very fair shot at earning their business, and uh, that's what we intend to do. Very helpful. Lisa, for my follow-up, um, and maybe Gene can help out here. It's, it's kind of well understood that your gross margin for MI300, 325 will be below corporate margins. If, could you help us maybe think of some framework on how those gross margins for instinct might get to parity with your corporate business? I know you probably won't give us a revenue level or a time frame, but maybe you could help us frame um, in some manner that we could uh, try and, and, and understand it. 
Yeah, we are very pleased with our overall revenue ramp of our data center TPO business, and our team not only support the revenue ramp and continue to improve the gross margin. Overall, it's below corporate average, and when you think about it, going into next year, of course, our top priority right now is really focus on to address customer demand and provide the TCO benefit, really increase significantly our market presence and drive substantial revenue growth. On the gross margin side, once we continue to ramp the revenue, we do think we'll have the opportunity to continue to improve gross margin. Uh, when you think about it, this is a data center business. Over the in the longer run, longer term, it tend to be better than corporate average. It will take a, some time to get there. But uh, when you look at the, our data center segment performance, uh, we more than double the revenue year over year, uh, but we triple the operating income year over year. So I think that's how we are thinking about it, is really to drive the long-term growth and get market presence at the same time drive a gross margin up. And our final question comes from the line of Thomas O'Malley with Barclays. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for letting me on. I really appreciate it. Lisa, I just wanted to ask on Mix uh, and the MI300 platform into Q4. Obviously, you're launching the 325 series. Should you say, you know, should we expect a significant contribution of the new product in Q4, um, or is this a situation in which it's launching late in the year and most of the impact is into Q1? Uh, I guess that's the first one. And then the second one is just, if you look into next year, could you talk about where the end markets are and embedded for Xilinx? You gave some color on com uh, and a little on industrial there, but just uh, where we're at in terms of starting kind of Q4 and into Q1, are there any that are outperforming, underperforming, uh, any color that would be helpful? And thanks for seeking me out. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Um, so uh, back to uh, your, your first question in terms of the mix in Q4, we would expect uh, the majority of the mix will, will still be on MI300. MI325 is going into production late in the quarter, and it will be more of a, uh, a first quarter ramp. Um, so that, that's that question. And then in terms of the embedded uh, business going to 2025, um, I would say that the trends that we see are, are similar to what I mentioned for, uh, you know, the Q3, Q4 uh, timing. Um, you know, we do expect that, uh, you know, we're, we're, some of the markets will recover. We're expecting that it will be a gradual recovery. So, um, you know, we see that. And, uh, the, you know, the strength that we see is in some of the, you know, test and emulation uh, segment, uh, we see some strength. Um, uh, certainly in uh, aerospace and defense, um, there was a little bit of recovery in automotive uh, that we started to see. Uh, we're still waiting for comms and, um, and, and industrial. So you know, we'll get more, color, more visibility on that as we go through, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the end of this year. But that, that's what we see currently. Thanks, Lisa. And at this time, we have reached the end of the question and answer session. And now I'd like to turn the floor back over to Mitch Hawes for any closing comments. That concludes today's call. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time.